Good science. afternoon in Europe and a good evening yeah. here in China. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, many thanks to Professor Tian Hailong for giving me the opportunity to chair the speech of Professor Paul Kurzweil. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you everyone for coming to keynote speeches part two. I'm Li Su Chung from Xiangtai University. It's a great honor for me to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Paul Kurzweil. He's a world famous social linguist and a professor of social linguistics at the Department of Language and Linguistic Science, University of York, UK. He was elected fellow of the British Academy, which represents the world leading researchers for the humanities and the social sciences in 2017。保罗科斯沃教授，世界著名社会语言学家，2017年当选英国国家学术院院士。学术院院士是英国国家学术院授予的人文社科领域最高荣誉，是对学者学术成就的最高认可。He was educated and got BA and MA in modern languages. MPhil and PhD in linguistics at the University of Cambridge. He previously worked at the universities of Durham, Cambridge, Reading, and Lancaster. His research interest is language variation and change. Since the early 1990s, Kurzweil has been the representative authority. For over 30 years, his research has been on dialect contact and new dialect formation. His doctoral research in Virgin Norway was a pioneering study of the linguistic consequences of migration. Important in developing theoretical perspectives and methodologies for dealing with data from British dialect contact situations have been four large projects of Kurzweil, which was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council of the UK. His later influential projects include a study of the British new town of Milton Keynes, as well as an investigation of mud culture London English, which was considered as a classical example of an urban contact dialect. His currently developing interest in historical social linguistics, as well as social linguistic issues in West Africa. Professor Kurzweil organized the first UK language variation workshop at Reading in 1997 and has contributed a lot to the development of social linguistic research in the UK, which is already at the top of the world. William Nabov introduced Kurzweil's studies of new speech communities as the essential readings in the area of social linguistics in an interview by Matthew Gordon in 2006. When William Noble was awarded the Medal for Linguistics by the British Academy in 2015, he twice mentioned Kurzweil's great contributions to push forward social linguistic researches in his award speech. So we are very, very lucky to have invited Professor Paul Kurzweil here and it's my extremely great pleasure to welcome Professor, Professor Kurzweil to talk about language, migration, and the nation in Europe and China. Please. Thank you very much, Professor Lin. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Okay. Right. And I'm going to share my screen. And please let me know if you don't see anything when, once I've done this. I um, have to find the right screen, that one. I think that is correct. Um, right, can I check with you that this is okay? Yeah? Yes. Okay, good, right. Yes. Right, so my topic is uh, language migration and the nation in Europe and China, fragmentation uh, and integration. So I want to cover these, these various ideas, um, trying to contrast Europe and China, that must be a quite a difficult task. They are both very diverse. Um, and I've only recently been introduced to China as a place to visit in the last three years or so. Anyway, so let me just start with an idea here that, uh, that is often raised in social linguistics, centripetal and centrifugal forces. So centripetal forces, these are in linguistic terms, a pull to the center, the increased use of a standard language for pragmatic reasons, maybe as a lingua franca, 
in a multilingual polity or for reasons of ideology. So this is uh, this is known as the standard language ideology as this term that's coined a few years ago by uh, Leslie and James Milroy. You can think of this as a, a sign of integration. And then centrifugal forces. This is a pull towards the local. So reinforcement and divergence of local languages and dialects for reasons of cohesion at the local level. So you can see these two things as being somehow opposite. And all nation states, including the ones that we are, are residing in, all of us, abhor fragmentation. They don't like fragmentation. Okay, migration and um, social cohesion. Okay, large scale migration has the potential to disrupt social cohesion and individual states may try to manage the disruption. There's always been migration, but the last 50 years or so, have seen it on a, on a really huge scale that even though it's not unprecedented, is much greater than the, um, over the previous half century. So migration is going to be central. Uh, one of the interesting things is the timing of these migrations. And this is something I'll, I'll come to right at the end, in, particularly in terms of, of China. So migration and language, Europe versus, versus China. So the question I want to address today is this. How does mass migration play out linguistically and socially in two very large multilingual regions of similar size, which nevertheless differ in fundamental ways? You might be surprised that I'm comparing 44 countries with a single country, but demographically, it does kind of make sense. So Europe is a, contains a large number of smaller nation states, not small necessarily, but medium sized. Whereas China is a single nation state, as we know. Okay, just in case you wondered where these two places are, here we see them on the same map. And you can see that China probably has a larger land area than Europe or similar land area to Europe, I would say. Okay, some key data that we need to have before in order to try to understand uh, what, what's happening linguistically in these two regions. Well, so Europe, as I mentioned, contains 44 nation states, population of 741 million. And according to the Encyclopedia of European Languages, there are 275 languages in Europe. In China, we have one state, population uh, 1,450,000,000, 1, so twice that of Europe. And a similar number of languages. Um, now, this is, this, is what, this is how the ethnologue counts languages. Um, many of these are known in, in Chinese, linguistics at least, as dialects. Okay. But let's just stick with this for the time being. It shows that the, the amount of linguistic diversity is pretty much the same in both Europe and China. Okay. What about nation building here? So in Europe, um, state formation began before the year 1000 of the, of the Common Era, but was consolidated from the 16th century and mainly complete by the 1870s. And here I, we, we can mention uh, Italy and Germany about 150 years ago, and then much more recently, the, the split of Yugoslavia in the 1990s and the, and the split of uh, the Czech Republic and Slovakia from former Czechoslovakia. So these are things that are still ongoing, but roughly speaking, not much has changed in terms of Europe's borders for 150 years or so. The national languages were already established, but standardization of those languages wasn't really complete until the 18th century or indeed later. And you see standardization still going on in, uh, in the former Yugoslavia, in, in Croatia um, and the other um, um, current states there. So what about China? Well, China has 3,000 3, years of spread of, the, uh, of this particular nation, language, and also centralization. And these are critical things because um, this is the, uh, one of the earliest examples of a, of a bureaucracy and a, a substantial uh, civil service with state exams of a kind that still exist and which of course exist now in, in other nations as well. And this um, 
it's been asserted, is what has necessitated writing for record keeping, so early literacy as, as well. Okay, and then much more recently, in the 20th, 20th and 21st centuries, um, you, there is also um, language planning. Um, Putungwa was promoted as the official language, I believe, from 1956 or so. So this is a, a sort of a, a people's version of standard Chinese, shall we say, that is, that is the, the ideology behind that spread. Okay, Europe. Okay, I'm not going to talk about each of these countries. Um, this is just to show the how many countries there are, uh, roughly 44. In terms of urbanization, um, Europe has been in the lead. Okay, the Industrial Revolution is something that, that began in, in Britain, in the, basically the north of England and south of Scotland and elsewhere in the country. Okay, so, so then uh, uh, tagged on the end, we then have the, the North, North European Industrial Revolution, which then merged with the British uh, industrial, industrial Revolution. So you, you had a northern region in Europe, which was, had become industrialized um, as, as well. And then further afield, uh, you have Japan that was also industrializing at the same time, and China too. Urbanization. Well, Britain was the very first country to be very be highly urbanized, as we'll see from the next slide. Okay, so by the 1830s, Britain was at the peak of the Industrial Revolution and the most urbanized country in Europe. So we, we see then in the 1831, according to the national census, 34% of the population lived in towns and cities. 1851, that's the, the time we get 50% of people in this country living in towns and cities. And then that expands 1931, 1991, and at the present time, uh, to, to 2020, that figure is slightly reduced. And that's because there's a strong counter urbanization. So people who can afford it move to, to the countryside and commute to the city, basically. So this is the, the key moment, uh, 1851, so 170 years ago. What about internal migration in, in the UK as somehow representative of, of Europe? Well, long distance migration in this country tends to be from the north to the south. And a good proportion of these are young university graduates. So they might come from the south, study in the north, places like York where I am now, and then migrate back to the south. Or they are northern themselves, they study in the north, and then migrate to the south. That is certainly, uh, you know, years ago, the experience that my friends had. Some people may move to the north and to rural areas, but, that's, but that is uh, probably less common altogether. But most internal migration in this country is local, meaning people move house, they might move to the other side of the town, they might get a job in the next town and so on. They don't move very far, that's internal migration. And of course that contrasts very strongly with China in the last 30 years or so. Okay, so here um, we see uh, a different kind of migration. This is external migration. So this is, shows the share of the UK population that was born abroad between 1851 and, and 2018. So you can see it was very, very small in the early period. You know, it wasn't until um, uh, 1911, I think, looking at it, you get two and a, a percentage of two and a half percent of people who were born outside the UK. And that figure is now 15% uh, uh, today. And a little bit later on, I'll be talking about London. Okay, so this is, so in London, the largest proportion of, of my, um, so, this is, so this is the place where the largest proportion of the population is from outside the UK. London has a population of around about 9 million. Um, of, of them, 37% are born outside the UK. And in fact, this figure is, is higher now than it, than it was in 2011, the time of the last census. So people born in India by far, I by, are by far the largest group, 304,000. And after that, Bangladesh and Poland, each around about um, 100, 140,000. And then another 
150, 200 nationalities, something like that. Okay, shifting across to the continent of Europe, um, Germany. I'm going to show you an age pyramid. And this tells us something about the, um, this, the people born and bred in Germany, German background. And then people who have a migration uh, background and people who are immigrants. So light brown, this is Germans with no migration background in, the, in their family histories to speak of. Um, then there is a substantial, and you can see that their average age is between 50 and 60. Um, that's, that's the bulk of, that's the largest single age group. If you look at people with a migration background, maybe they have one parent, two parents from another country. Um, their, their average age is between 30 and 40. So that is, that's the, the green part. And then the dark brown area, a similar age, age profile. These are people who have migrated from another country to Germany. So you see, uh, this is something that, that repeats itself, that you get um, uh, migrants tend to be younger than the indigenous population, which we say the, the existing population. Very similar thing for Norway. And here you're, you're going to see a similar chart. Okay, so you have in this, in this case, um, three colors. Okay, green, um, this shows um, immigration, uh, uh, the, the people immigrating to Norway. And uh, this, this doesn't show age distribution, actually. It shows the number of people migrating at particular times. So it, show, it tells us that the, uh, that the peak migration, out migration, shall we say, was round about 2011 in Norway. So the yellow area, yellow brownie area, is, is the, the net immigration. So the net number of people coming in. And of course, people also moved out of Norway. So they are the, uh, the purple, okay. Right, nothing about age distribution there, but it's similar. Okay, now, and this is an interesting uh, list of information that I, I got. Why did people immigrate to Norway? Well, 39% were joining family who already lived in Norway, who were previous migrants, most likely. 32% went there because they, they were seeking employment, either they looked for employment or they already had it, and then, uh, quite a large proportion, approximately 23%, were refugees and asylum seekers. And then 5% went to Norway to get educated, to Norwegian universities mainly from um, particularly the Global South countries. So that is a general profile. We'll see a similar profile for China in a few minutes. China. Okay, just one flag this time. And here is an age pyramid for China in 1964. So it's very unlike the German one. Uh, we don't, we're not dealing with, with migration here. We're dealing with the number of people in particular age groups. As, as you can see, there are very few elderly people, a tiny number, and a very large number of young children in 1964. And this is, um, this, uh, is part, I guess, of the massive population expansion that took place from that period um, until fairly recently. So this is the age pyramid um, 50 years later, and it sees, shows that the population expansion had peaked by that time there. So it's a more sort of, I suppose the bulk of population was between uh, 25 and 50, something like that. Okay, population growth uh, since, since 1900. Okay, so these are, first of all, uh, estimated population of 400 million, so already probably the biggest country in the world at that time, I would imagine. Rising in 50 years to, to 554 million, and then 70 years after that to the, the present 1.4 billion. Okay, and you can see then a, a chart underneath, comparing it with India and United States. So India is actually catching up, as, as we know. So it's a very large expansion. Okay. Now, Urbanization is something we need to look at. So urbanization since 1980. So China's urban population reached 781 million in 2017. Uh, and that accounted for uh, a certain percentage of the population. I see my own face there. Oh dear, that's gone wrong, isn't it? Um, anyway, a proportion of the population, I can't read it because I've got, I've got my own image sitting on top of the number. 
No matter, because we can then look at this at a chart that's coming up, the rural population, so that is the obverse, if you like, of rural. Until 1980, it was still 80%. That was a figure that Britain hadn't seen since about 1800, okay, more than 200 years ago. But by 2020, this rural population had gone down to 40%. And here you can see the, uh, a chart of the, uh, the reduction of rural population. And of course, the, um, the opposite of that is urbanization. Okay, now it's uneven. This population, uh, this, this the rural to urban migration is what it is, is uneven. And this chart shows that, uh, okay, the blue bars, these are population outflow areas, okay. Where did people uh, migrate from? What kind of places? In two, 2001 to roughly, I think it's 2006 or something, or 2010, I haven't got the complete information. But then the latter period, this is the or brownie orange bars, this, this shows that, that, the, it is, that it's much greater. And it shows that the northeast of the country, so the bit north and east of, of Beijing, is the, is the, uh, <clears throat> the area that saw the, the greatest outflow. Okay, this is a map uh, showing outflows as well. So basically, the darker the green, the greater the outflow. And then, if it's more on the red, pinky area or dark brown area, this shows inflow. Okay, gain in population through migration. So the, uh, it's moved, moving towards the coast and Beijing and uh, Tianjin as well, and um, Shanghai, places like that. But more recently, I'm t I've, I've read, in fact, the migration is going the opposite way into the central inland provinces um, as prices get higher in, along the coast and there are more opportunities. So we have very complex, very large migration here. This shows population growth, which obviously is to do with migration, uh, but is also to do with, with natural increase. So we see some of the Western uh, provinces, uh, Xinjiang and Tibet, in fact, increasing as well. Right, what did people, what are people doing? The migra migration, migrating populations doing, comparing that with, with the Norwegian case? Well, as you would expect, there's a lot of uh, manufacturing industry in China um, in a way that there isn't in Norway. Um, difficult to compare to such diverse countries, very small versus very large. But, but there's a lot of people in the, in the wholesale and retail and hotel and, and catering. Uh, and then it, there's quite a mix of other things as well. So these are the economic sectors. Okay, so um, what can we then learn from the population statistics of Europe and China. So take Europe first of all. So in Northern Europe, which is the bit I'm dealing with mostly, we have long distance migration from the global south, basically the former colonies and some other countries, and Eastern Europe, ex-Soviet bloc countries, and also Southern Europe to some extent as well, like Spain. People often came from poor rural backgrounds and they arrived in areas that were already heavily urbanized, okay. And this led to an increase in cultural and linguistic diversity in the areas of arrival, like the big cities of Northern Europe. In China, of course, we have a much larger scale of, uh, of migration, unprecedented in size. Um, and the, the push factor here was the massive rise in the rural population, presumably caused by better healthcare, in fact. And we see this as a push factor actually in the 19th century migrations from countries like Norway, that the rural population rose a great deal 150 years ago. And that led to a very, you know, half the population of Norway going to America, Ireland similarly. So this is a modern day equivalent. Okay, so the Southern and Eastern cities were very attractive to the rural migrants for economic reasons. But in terms of the increase in cultural and linguistic diversity, for reasons which I'm going to come back to, there was a smaller increase in these areas than in Europe. Okay, four overarching questions for social linguists. I'm not going to try to answer all of these, but they are in a sense the program, programmatic here. What are the linguistic outcomes of migration in Europe and China? And can the processes involved be ascribed to linguistic factors 
in the language and dialect contact involved, such as linguistic distance. So does the fact that the, the languages are, are very different from each other in Europe uh, account for some of the uh, linguistic outcomes, like bilingualism, code switching, things like that, that took place. Are there specific social factors affecting language and dialect contact, which is what uh, happens when people migrate, such as residential segregation, either formal or voluntary, this means people living in different areas from each other, or the age of the speakers, are they young, old, are they children? These, these have uh, various effects on outcomes here. And fourthly, are there ideological factors, especially a striving for social and lingu linguistic integration on the part of the authorities, the migrants, and, and the host population, that is the non-existing population? Or are these motivations somehow in conflict? I'll come back to this point. Okay, let's have a look at some uh, dialects now. We have in Northwest Europe, what, what are often called urban contact dialects, new dialects. We begin in Norway um, and we find here in Oslo, the capital city, that young people are aware of a way of talking which is used by both second generation immigrant and North and Norwegian descended youth. Okay, so there's a new way of talking that all young people have access to and sometimes use. They will tell interviewees about, uh, you know, that there, there are words from other languages, the tone is different, there's a har harsh speech with them. These are, these are, these are the way people express that they, uh, their awareness of this, these new language varieties. There are slang words from Berber, e.g. Uh, which means girls. And there's, a, there's morphine mixing as well, and this is one I quite like, which, uh, which is composed of the Norwegian prefix drit, which means dirt, um, and then Berber spa, which means good. So that means very good, okay, in, in my correct standard English. It's part of the repertoire, which includes standard Norwegian as well for these, for these young people. In Berlin, we find a lot of lexicon, from Turkish, the, 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 the Turkish, original Turkish population is, is, is the biggest uh, single group, so there's quite a lot of vocabulary from there. There's some morphological change, some simplification of determinism and, and grammatical gender, and then in syntax there are some changes as well, so the subject verb word order um, might change, so where standard German has a verb, a verb subject, um, it, it, uh, it ends up as a subject verb. I'm not, I, I won't explain any more than that. Um, then there are expressions with bare noun phrases instead of prepositions and articles. So you get things like ich bin Schule, which means I am in school, at school. Should be, or at least it is in standard German, ich bin in der Schule, I am in the school. And then you have this next expression, Morgen ich gehe Arbeitsamt. So there are two things there. One is they, that the subject and verb are inverted. Uh, uh, and then sum, which means to the. So I, tomorrow I'm going to the uh, unemployment uh, office. New grammatical innovations. There are two mentioned here. I, th I think I, I won't try to explain them, but they are present in this, this, this variety. Next we have um, London's multicultural London English. Okay, so this is based on uh, the two projects that I was involved in in the early 2000s. Uh, you can see the people involved here, the two projects and uh, the funder ESRC, and those are some names at the bottom there. We worked in the borough of Hackney in North London, in, that's basically the inner city of London, and also the outer London borough of Havering. So what's the socio-historical context of this? Okay, I've introduced a new word, multi-ethnolect. Well, uh, high in-migration of population originating from countries other than the UK from the 1950s onwards, and particularly in the last 30 years. Poverty, okay, there's, there's a lot of poverty in the areas where this is spoken. Dense social networks, a strong family and neighborhood ties, and they often extend across language groups rather than being within language groups. And this is why you, you end up with many different ethnicities, including 
uh, white British ethnicity speaking this in this way. Okay, so there that states the same thing there. So Hackney, the borough I just mentioned, um, okay, uh, it tells us, this chart tells us that 44% are actually white British. And then there are all these other ethnicities which you can see listed down there. Um, and I won't try to read those out. Okay, a couple of uh, examples then. Bear NPs with verbs of motion. So they go skating rinks instead of they go to skating rinks. And then I used to go Stratford. I used to go to Stratford. By the way, this is part of London. This is this is not where Shakespeare uh, used to live. Uh, I used to go Stratford. And then this is an, uh, an interesting one here. Um, so, a new pronoun man. I'll just read this out. I don't really mind how my girl looks. If she looks decent, yeah. And there's one bit of her face that just looks mashed, yeah. I don't care. It's a personality man's looking at. I'm not even looking at the girl proper like. Okay, so you have man there. Indefinite pronoun of some kind, but it has a first person reference. So it's a personality I'm looking at. Okay, so this is a, this word man is fairly prominent in uh, multicultural London English. What languages have influenced multicultural London English? Well, Caribbean, I spelled that incorrectly. Creoles, ex-colonial Englishes, Africa, India, Caribbean, learner varieties of English, the lo local London vernacular, school varieties like standard English and the teacher's own speech, and then media, so TV, YouTube, Instagram, popular music. The important thing is that actually monolingual English speakers are also exposed to all these varieties. And this is why multicultural London English is shared across ethnic and linguistic groups. Are they a new type of speech community, these multi-ethnic languages? And we seem to find examples in several cities. And this is the idea of the multi ethnolect okay? Speech varieties with multiple origins. Okay, and now uh, I'm going to cover, before I close, two Chinese studies of dialect and migration. First one is, is by Marinus van den Berg, um, University of Leiden. He, he's allowed me to use these slides here. So, he did a project, still doing a project, I guess, the restructuring of Chinese speech communities, natives, migrants, and communication practices in Xi'an, Shanxi province. Um, and he sees this as a following on from a, what he terms a new urban rev revolution, which comes, came after the uh, anti-urbanization policy of the Cultural Revolution. So a new urban revolution after 1980, and uh, Deng Xiaoping, I believe, was uh, instrumental in, in this. So this is the only chart I'm going to show you uh, from his interviews and, uh, that, that he did, and actually his, his research, Chinese research team did. And um, across the top, you find uh, people who claim various ethnicities and language groups. So you have Xi'an dialect, Shanxi dialect, Hernan, other dialects, and PTH Putonghua. And then you find various contexts, uh, domains, uh, um, the people's f first language, language they use at home in Xi'an in the city, what they consider the best language and at work. So rather than go through this chart, I'm just going to leave, leave you with that and just say, well, you know, there's a lot of language choice going on. Uh, and there are, there are multiple layers of uh, migration and language. He talks about overlapping speech and discourse communities as well. Overall, Putonghua is favoured at work and other dialects elsewhere. So that is the pattern, and I think that's probably the pattern in, in many cities in, in China as well. Finally, Wang Xuan in, in Ho Hot, um, she did her PhD in, in New Zealand, and I had the privilege of examining that thesis a couple of years ago. Um, so Ho Hot then is, like many cities, uh, an immigrant city, but not recent immigration, 1950s, 1960s immigration. So she looked at a number of uh, phonetic features in the Mandarin of Hohot. She looked at language attitudes. Uh, the city was subject to large-scale migration as part of the industrialization in the 50s and 60s. And the st study comprised Old Town and New Town speakers. Um, I'll show you that in just a moment. There, there was a sharp divide both in where people lived and in their attitudes to each other. So this is a general map of, this is one of her slides. 
um, so this is um, this shows the old town which was established long before the industrialization and the new town where the industrialization took place so there was an old dialect the Jin dialect um, and then there was a variety of migrants community who were speakers of, of various kinds of Mandarin so what ended up then is something she called hupu which is hot uh, ho -ho Mandarin something intermediate if you like that is that is the sort of outcome of, of the contact that went on she summarized this by saying, okay, among the elderly speakers, there were, uh, in, the, in the new town, th there were uh, negative attitudes towards the, the Jin dialect, and also among middle age towards the old town itself. But the young people had, in a sense, in integrated with each other. There were few effects of attitudes on language production among younger speakers. So, conclusions, first of all, uh, in China, we do China, and then we look at look at Europe. The uh, the strong position of Putonghua today seems to have led to uh, bilingualism, bidialectalism everywhere in the country. And I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm completely wrong about some of these things here. Dialect change appears to be towards Putonghua, resulting in local forms of Mandarin alongside local dialect and also Putonghua. So you have this, this sort of three varieties that merge into each other, something like what you'd see in, in uh, Xi'an, I guess. People have complex re repertoires and they switch between repertoire, between registers. And then, and then I, the thought struck me is that these, all this research in Xi'an and, and Hohot and elsewhere is not the most recent migrations of the last 20 or 30 years. It is actually to do with industrialization uh, 50 or so years ago. Has this not been investigated, the, the linguistic results of the recent migrations? Language planning and support for some of the local languages and dialects in China serve to maintain this diversity, and that's uh, probably an unusual feature of, of China in relation to Europe. Um, there is, at an overt level, a match between ideology, attitudes, and language use, but maybe it's, you know, it's worth scratching and then having a look underneath. Conclusions in Europe. Well, there are no particular policies for internal migrants, but countries vary in official policy towards external migrants. The hostile attitudes and policies are increasing in Europe. So there's an integrationist ideology in France. There's multiculturalism in the UK, Scandinavia, Germany, Netherlands. And there seems to be outright hostility, at least in some parts of, of Europe today. Okay, there are new recent mixed low status varieties such as multicultural London English and also ethnic varieties such as Pakistani English in, in England. It's not clear whether these varieties, which are mostly, mostly youth languages, will become mainstream or whether they will persist. But they are well known and they, uh, they're strongly associated with countercultural movements such as different forms of hip hop in London, grime and drill. And then finally, do we have integration or fragmentation? Well, strongly integrationist pulls in both official policy and majority attitudes to migration in both Europe and China, that is shared. Public discourses are also against fragmentation but there's a variation in outcomes. So in Europe, there's a history of nation states um, and fragmentation in Europe has been in the last 500 years at the level of the continent itself. The European Union is a mainly successful attempt to overcome this, but we see uh, you know, impending disaster, or at least I do, in terms of the departure of the UK from Europe, from the European Union. There's official recognition of indigenous minority languages, but not immigrant languages. And then also you have this countercultural force represented by the new mixed language varieties that are in Britain and, and elsewhere. In China, I haven't got so much to say. Um, it, <laughs> there's much uh, longer history of assimilation and integration of separate peoples and ethnicities down through the millennia. Today, there's recognition of many of these uh, separate people and peoples and ethnicities, as well as their dialects and languages. So there are challenges ahead for both Europe and China. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you, Professor Caswell.
Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Now we still have a few minutes for question. Question. Do you have any <coughs> questions? So we have some questions from the chat box. Okay. Could we take the first one first? Okay, there's one from okay, uh, from a student, a student of social linguistics. Could I mm -hmm. ask you a question as a student of social linguistics? We know your PhD thesis about language change of the mm -hmm. immigrant in Beijing, Norway is considered as a pioneering study of the linguistic consequences of migration. Um, you explored the notion of nested speech communities and mm -hmm. proposed a model of language and dialect contact. My question is, when you began your early studies as a PhD student, did you mm -hmm. know that your work was innovative? When did you come to realize your <laughs> tremendous impact on the research for immigrant language change? Would you please give some suggestions for students of researchers like me? Thank you. That's a qu uh, question from a student of social okay, linguistics. My, yeah, okay. sure. My first question is, can you actually see me? Because I seem to have lost the picture. Can you see me as I speak here? Can you see me? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. You, you can, right? I can't see you, but I can see me. I, so I, I can't figure out how to bring the thing back up to the screen. Anyway, um, wait a minute. Uh, bring... Could you see, this, see the chat box? Yes, I, I can see various things, but I can't see any images at the moment. Uh, oh, stop share. Maybe we can yeah, add. you should stop share. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Right. That's it. Fine. Yeah, I can, I can see the chat box now as well. Um, when, I was, when I did my PhD, um, I was not aware. I, I didn't give any thought to whether... Um, what I was doing was innovative, but I noticed that there hadn't been much research on dialect and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and migration. I think that's my short answer to that question. Okay. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's important, as I said also, it's important now to start looking at the, at the recent migrant groups in different cities in, the, in China. Okay, that's that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> still any suggestions for students or for student researchers? <laughs> oh right, like well, I mean, I know some of your students, and I know the excellent yes. research yes. they've been doing, and I think there should just be more of that of that kind of research. I mean, you could look at uh, look more at attitudes. You could look at uh, you know age differences, and you've got to continue to look at people who who've migrated. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, maybe I mean in your city, Xiangtan, maybe that hasn't received very large waves of of recent migration. Maybe that's the the coast, but. Um, yes, there were certainly look, yeah, certainly looking at other, looking at migrants generally, I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. There are any more? So there are two minutes. Any more questions from the audience? Anyone? We have more questions in the chat box, better. Yeah. Uh, right. Anyone? Some, some trying, let's see how many we got. Um, what I'd like to oh. do is to say, is it possible to save these questions? Yeah, yes, so yeah. I, can, I, I, I think we'd better get afterwards. one from the audience. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. The second question is the local Putonghua as a variant of standard Putonghua is becoming more and more significant in Chinese daily life. So <coughs> the question, does such kind of variant also exist in the process of language contact in Europe? <laughs> Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, there are very much so. I think there are strong parallels with uh, with this country, with Germany, uh, Italy. That, that that there are local versions of more or less standard English with strong local accents. I think that is true in in Britain. Um, in Germany, you have local variants of standard German um, with local accents, particularly in the south of Germany. In Italy, you have very strong local dialects, which they even call languages. And then you have uh, local forms of spoken Italian, which have, which have come up in the last 50 years or so. So the answer is yes, something very similar is going on. Okay, thank you very much. And so time is perfect. I'll save this question for you to answer later. And uh, it's really a, a great pleasure listening to your wonderful talk. And thanks for your time, Professor Caswell. Thank you, everybody, for your attendance. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for listening.